listen with your brain, not with your ears. Let me start right away by demonstrating that this is true. You will be my experimental subject, and I'll ask you to listen to something. You'll then tell me what you've heard. Moral. 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 Who heard Laurel? Who heard Yanni? Here you go. Some of, some of you heard Laurel. Laurel, some heard Yanni, and some might have heard even a different sound. And I guess you all agree with me that those two sounds, Laurel and Yanni, are pretty different. So why is it so? It's not because some of you have any special hearing capabilities. Not because of your gender, or because where you sit in the room, but it's because of context, or because what sounds your brain emphasizes. In other words, it's because you hear with your brain and not with your ears. In my research lab at the Department of Biomedicine of the University of Basel, we seek to understand how neurons work together to give rise to such subtle and unique auditory experience. Let me go a step back and explain you how hearing works. In order to hear, you need three things. You need a sound, you need an ear, and you need a brain. A sound is, before it reaches an ear, a change in air pressure that is provoked by the movement of my vocal cords when I speak, or by the movement of the membrane when the sound comes from a speaker. Once the sound reaches an ear, it then puts in movement membranes bones and liquids in what is called the middle and the inner ear. This then reaches small cells, the hair cells, that transform a sound into an electrical signal that is then sent to the auditory nerve and finally to the brain. As long as a sound is in an ear, it is perceived as a microphone would record it, but not after. The brain does not work like a microphone. The brain transforms the sounds to each of you with your unique brain so that you all perceive sounds in a very unique and subjective way. This change is related to different factors. Let me first explain you why we care, actually. Why is it important to understand that we listen with the brain and not with the ears? Obviously, it is because it tells us that whatever we listen to is never what is exactly what is out there. It is transformed and modified so that you all perceive things slightly differently. But we also care because the brain is very malleable. And if we don't hear properly, in case of diseases, for example, tinnitus or attention disorders, we could use this brain's malleability to try to reinstate normal function or to rewire the brain. Let me give you three examples of factors that do influence how we perceive sounds. The first one has to do with the malleability of a young brain. A few months ago, on March 4th, at 4 a.m. in the morning, I went to the city center with my two daughters to watch the scary masks, the lanterns, the piccolos and the drums that all belong to the traditional carnival of Basel. In addition to having a lot of unusual uh, sensory information that reached my brain, my head also got covered with repli thrown out by the crowd. Repli being the Swiss German word for confettis. I then told my daughter, see, I'm full of repli. And they both immediately said, it's not repli, it's repli. <laughs> I tried to repeat it a few times, but I never got it according, uh, correctly according to them. Also for me, what they were saying was exactly what I was saying. <laughs> My brain could not make the difference between both sounds. The, and it was always exactly the same version, but of course not for my daughters. So we moved to Basel in 2015, when they were still three years and five years old. We have been exposed for the exact same number of years to Swiss German, 
But not only did they pick up the language much faster than I did, they also speak it without any accent whatsoever. whatsoever. It is not my case at all, and it will never be. So what explains this? It is not that they have any special language gift that I wouldn't have, but it is because they have been exposed to Swiss German and to all the sounds that belong to this language during childhood in a time window known as a critical period for plasticity, where the brain is still very malleable or plastic to whatever it is exposed to and changes its connectivity according to the sounds it perceives, thereby also losing the capability to distinguish sounds that it never heard. This malleability or plasticity is much, much smaller in adults and even of a different nature. That explains, this is one of the factors that explains why you all perceive sounds differently. It's, it is because you listen with your brain and your brain has been shaped by whatever you've been exposed to as children. Another example I want to give here on how your brain perceives sounds in different ways has to do with brain state. So an extreme change in brain state is when we go from sleep to wakefulness. When you sleep, you don't hear the car passing by under the window, but when you're awake, you do. This change in brain state is extreme, but there are much more subtle changes in brain state that you exercise all of you constantly during the day, and that can be qualified as attention. When you attend to a sound, you listen to it hopefully what you're doing when I talk right now. And when you don't attend to a sound, you just hear it, maybe with the sounds that your neighbor or the crowd is doing right now. We all grasp the difference between listening and hearing, and how radically differently a sound can be perceived if we listen to it or if we just hear it. What lies behind it is your brain and the neural circuits that deal with, in this case, attention. Brain state strongly influences how your brain listens to sounds, not how your ears do it. The third example I want to give is how expectation can influence how your brain listens to sounds. Let me illustrate this with a video of Mona. You will look at her very carefully and let me know what you hear. Bar, 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 bar. What did you hear? Bar. So now let me show you a second video and look at her again very carefully. Let me know what you hear this time. Bar, 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 bar. Far or far, maybe some of you. Let me try to play the exact same video again. Now I put a mask on Mona's mouse. And what do you hear? Far, 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 far. What did you hear? Pa. <laughs> to prepare these videos, I always use the exact same soundtrack. I put it once on the original video, the first one you saw, where Mona was saying bar, and uh, another time I put it on another video was where Mona was actually saying far, as you could probably see from her lips. So those of you who heard far or var in the second video got tricked by what your eyes were seeing. So your eyes were seeing the lips making far, you were therefore expecting to hear the corresponding sound far and not the real one that was bar. So this is an example that illustrates how what you see can strongly influence how you hear. In another way, in another words, it explain it really illustrates how the visual input and your expectation of what you will hear will modify the perception of the sounds that reach your ears. So with these three examples, I hope I've been able to convince you that you listen with your brain and not with your ears. 
In my research lab, we tried to understand how neurons work together to give rise to such a subjective and unique auditory experience. We have, for example, found out that there's not only one critical period, but many of them, that they can be unique to very specific sound features, and that they last much longer than we thought before, well up to adolescence. We have also found out that attention affects information processing in a much bigger network than initially thought, allowing us to refine our hypothesis about what controls attention. So why do I do this? Why do I care? Obviously, I care because I want to treat disorders and fix the brain when it doesn't work properly. Wouldn't it be nice if we could understand how to keep our attention focused and get rid of unwanted distractions? Or if we could use or reinstate some of the malleability of a young brain into an adult brain, not to get rid of an accent, but to fix the brain in case of hearing abnormalities so that patients could enjoy a conversation again? Another reason why I care about this, and maybe an even more important one, is because I want to understand how the brain lies between us and the outside world. How it allows us to enjoy a conversation, how it makes us hide from noise, how it gives rise to the subtle auditory experience when we listen to a masterpiece of music, even bringing us to tears sometimes, and ultimately how it makes us unique. I study this because I want to understand how your brain makes each of you unique. Thank you. <laughs>